here very shortly. Okay, again, welcome everyone to the town hall this evening. Um, just as a, a couple of things, I'll introduce myself in a second, but just since it's here on the title slide, I'd like to remind everybody, we're gonna record this this evening just so everybody knows full disclosure, we'll be doing that. We're using WebEx event. Uh, so if you haven't used that before, it may be a little different than some of your typical uh, video conferencing software, or if you use WebEx meetings, it's slightly different, not a lot different. One of the things though, it does have a question and answer box labeled Q and A. So there you should be able to find a tab or a box, depending on how, how you've got your setup, where you can type in questions and answers. We'll be monitoring that, and that'll be the easiest way for you to ask questions of myself and, and the two students that'll be participating with us uh, this evening. Again, I just put a little outline here, and I've got some, some PowerPoint slides, mostly to let me make sure I don't forget what to talk about and don't wander off topic too far. So my name is Bill Crossley. I'm the J. William Urig and Anastasia Bornas Head of Aeronautics and Astronautics here at Purdue University. I'm, I'm really happy that you can all join us tonight. Um, I'm gonna try to give some quick updates about the school. And as is, is often typical of faculty members, I probably have too many slides, so I'll watch my uh, time pretty quickly and I might skip a few things. We asked a couple of students to give you their perspectives so you can get a different view. You know, it's one thing for the head to talk with you and I hope you think that my input's important. But if a lot of you have questions about the student perspective, particularly during COVID, both Julia and Zach will be able to help you with those. And we'll try to save plenty of time for questions and answers here at the end of the, of the meeting. Several of you sent in questions in advance, and so we've got those as well. And, and Stacy Clarity, our communications director, will help us do the Q&A at the end of today's event. So let me go get started. I've got a couple of notes here. One is just a really quick reminder that we're, we're finishing up our 75th anniversary uh, back on July 1st in 1945. The School of Aeronautics became its own independent academic unit growing out of the mechanical engineering. And so again, this is our 75th academic year. We've been celebrating with lots of different virtual events, a lot of faculty feature stories, some really neat video messages from alumni and friends, a timeline, et cetera. So if you haven't checked out our 75th anniversary yet, I've got it on the screen here, but you just need to Google Purdue AE 75th and you'll be able to find that pretty quickly. And thanks to those of you who have contributed to those videos and those different messages. I wanted to give a quick update on the program. Um, you know, we've got mixed opinions about US News and World Report rankings. They are important and people do look at them. And so people, I wanted to share those with everybody. The 2021 rankings were actually released back in September. So that was after the last time we had this uh, town hall meeting. So just to give you a current update of where our colleagues think Purdue's undergraduate program ranks. And I phrase that on purpose that way. The engineering specialty rankings are really based on department heads like myself re reporting what we think are really outstanding programs in aerospace engineering. And those get ranked based on the number of people that say we think this is an outstanding aerospace engineering program. So the top 10 are at right. There's a few ties, including us being tied with Stanford at fifth place. We were tied last year, fourth place with Embry-Riddle. And you can look at that list and see how they've been, we move around a little bit. I think as long as we're in the top 10, that's really important because it means our reputation is really good. Top five is nice, but some of it's a, a, um, not completely a popularity contest, but I have to admit there's part of it. So being ranked by our colleagues pretty highly is really important. The reputation score in the far column there is actually the reputation of the university, uh, sorry, of the College of Engineering as a whole at these different programs. And our College of Engineering was ranked ninth in the country in these rankings for undergraduate engineering. So number five is, I, I think we're a little bit better than number five, but number five is quite admirable. The graduate report, they, they did the 2021 rankings, they came out in March of 2020. And so we're expecting the 2022 rankings to come out here shortly. We don't have them out yet. They're probably at the end of this month. And so our, our standing is six for graduate program, which is also, again, following the same discussion I had before, I think was pretty good. Last year we tied with Michigan. 
somebody changed their vote, maybe, um, maybe a new department head showed up. I'm not sure exactly why that changes, uh, but, but our, you know, our, we're not that far off from Michigan last year. Uh, and we're tied with them last year. Again, the top 10 is, is here at the right. College of Engineering as a whole has moved up to seven from eight between the 2020 and the 2021 rankings. So again, I think Purdue is in really good company and our aeronautics and astronautics program is also in very good company. Also thinking about our program, I wanted to share this. Some of you who have talked with me have seen this and I showed something similar to this back in the fall um, town hall. If you're joining us for the first time, I only have the history for the last 10 years, and this is the fall official enrollment for each of these years. You can see a general upward trend. The top line is our total enrollment, the middle line is our undergraduate enrollment, and the bottom line is our graduate enrollment. And in fall 2020, we are at a record enrollment for, for these categories. 1,546 students is a record, and, and also the number of graduate and undergraduate students individually, those are also records. So it's, it's kind of a good news. We're a very popular program, both for graduate and undergraduate students. And, but it's also a challenge for us because it puts uh, some pressure on us given the high enrollments. So I've got a couple of slides to just make sure I don't forget a few of these things looking ahead. So right now, I guess technically not looking ahead in spring, but spring we know from asking what our enrollment is here. Right now we have 904 undergraduate students and 585 graduate students. So the number of undergraduate students has dropped a little bit because going from fall semester to spring semester, we have many students graduate, but far fewer students move from first year engineering into aeronautics and astronautics during the spring. So that drop is not un unexpected. Graduate students is about the same because graduate students work basically on their pace of their research if they're doing a thesis. So graduation rates tend to vary a little bit more than the undergraduates. We've done some work to project for fall 2021. So that's the coming semester that start the next academic year. And our current projection, again, is both good and also maybe a little bit scary. 1,120 undergraduate students. So sophomores through seniors in standing. This will be, you know, basically um, since we had 956 in fall of 2020 and we'll have 1120 in fall of 2021, this is still another big growth. So you can see that difference there. Um, and, and it's great because it means we're popular. So it's just something that we wanna pay attention to, I think, and I just share with everybody that of the different programs in aeronautics and astronautics, we will likely continue to have the highest student to faculty ratio in the college. So there's lots of things on social media and discussions about how mean and how tough we are to get into, but part of it's driven by our demand and just the resources we've got available. So I wanted to set that for everybody. Again, it's, I think it's a good, good issue for us to have, but it does present some challenges for us. Obviously we've been doing this in COVID-19, so I wanted to give some updates. When I talked to you, we were last time I did a, a, a town hall, and again, maybe not all of you are on that. The last time I did this, we were looking forward to just about starting the fall 2020 semester. And we had a mix of on-campus and online options. The on-campus classrooms were de-densified. We have you know, spacing at six feet apart for students. Occupancy in most rooms was 50% or less of their max capacity. We had lots of options for students to take courses remotely. To be fair, even though we did it in a hurry in, in, in spring of 2020 to respond to the crisis, we were still doing a lot of learning on the fly. Um, I think we did pretty well. All of our AAE lecture-based courses had online experience options. The lab courses still took place when greatly reduced numbers. We had students wearing protective equipment in addition to face masks were appropriate and we pulled that off. Spring 2021 was similar, although we did shift to having more on per, in-person uh, options. We still allowed students that needed to be online to do it online. We still allowed students to not have to show up to class. If they had, they felt ill, we didn't want them coming. So there were ways to access content remotely. And so there's a good balance there. And we found that some students actually preferred the online delivery for all kinds of different reasons. So there's a wide variety of student experiences there. But, you know, I always hear some, some stories that aren't so great. But overall, I think the experience for aeronautics and astronautics students has really been positive given the current environment. And we've had no evidence of any transmission of, of COVID-19 in a classroom or in an instructional laboratory. We've got pretty good contract, contact tracing here at Purdue. And when people have contracted COVID, it's been from usually from a, a group living, uh, you know, situation like a cooperative housing or fraternity or sorority, et cetera. It's not been from being in the classroom. 
So being in the classroom has been pretty safe for our students. When I did the fall meeting, we had just started ramping back up our research. And in fact, I think Purdue was ahead of most of the large research uh, intensive universities. Because by July, we already had 5,000 people back involved in on-campus in-person research. We were almost back to 100% of our on-campus in-person research by the end of the fall 2020 semester in Aero and Astro. So we were able to have our students in the labs, working with faculty and research staff on their projects. A lot of our computational analytical research has remained remote because that made sense. In my case, my students and I do most of the computational research, so we were able to do that. We've still been working remotely. We have had cases where someone who's been working in an on-campus lab has been either exposed to someone with COVID or has, has been diagnosed with COVID. And so we have really good protocols to close down that space and, and clean it and then get it back up and going after a certain period of time. And so, we, again, we haven't seen any transmission in the research spaces, and I think we've done a good job with that. So looking ahead, summer is going to operate a lot like spring. In, in aeronautics and astronautics, we have a small number of courses in the summer, not zero, but small, and they'll have de-densified classrooms and they'll have online capability. In fall, though, we're planning to move back to close to typical on-campus operations. And so I've got a bunch of bullets there to make sure that I make a few points clear. Purdue has been very good about saying, look, if we need to change, we'll change. So some of the decisions get made closer to last minute, but I think that's smart given the situation. Right now, the thinking is that everybody who wants a vaccine will have one by August. We're still wrestling, we being Purdue, I'm not in this team, but the, the Purdue medical team that's helping here is going to look at whether we think we need to require vaccinations to be on campus. Some of you may be aware we required the flu vaccine to get back onto campus last year to make sure that people didn't get flu and or COVID at the same time. So that's still in process. The intent is to move back to near 100% capacity in classrooms. We'll probably be wearing face masks and things, but we think that the, the distancing may not be necessary. So most of our courses will be back to in-person delivery. Some of our courses make sense to just to be online regardless of COVID. So those may still stay online. And again, details will be coming over the summer how fall is going to work. But I'm 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 personally optimistic we'll be not back to the way it was exactly before COVID, but much closer. And so I think that'll be a better experience for the faculty and the students. A couple of highlights I want to do real quick, and I can't give justice to everything going on in the school. So I just picked three things to talk about to give you kind of three different points. One of them is that the Board of Trustees just approved the new building for our hypersonics facilities. And, and Purdue Aeronautics and Astronautics is a leader in hypersonic testing capability. We're, we're in the process now of designing and developing a Mach 8 quiet flow tunnel. It'll be the, the fastest quiet flow tunnel. We're pretty famous for having the first Mach 6 quiet flow tunnel. So it'll have speeds that are the right conditions to consider hypersonic flow. Our friends at Northrop Grumman facilitated donating us the high pulse, which is in the picture here at the right. It's a shock tunnel that doesn't necessarily do the same speed, but it does the same enthalpy at Mach 25. So in my layman's terms, the Mach 8 has the right speed, but the wrong temperature. The high pulse has the wrong speed, but the right temperature to do a hypersonics. I'm greatly oversimplifying for those of you who know about hypersonics, but what it means is Purdue is going to have outstanding capabilities here. This very large building will also include some space for restricted research so we can do work that, that wouldn't be open to the public. This is a neat story. Brandon Terry here, who's, if you can see my cursor on the left in your picture, is one of our PhD students, started a small company here supported by Purdue and the Research Park. They've developed a new solid rocket fuel, and they're going to build a new facility and add 50 jobs to the community. It's kind of a neat, someone coming to Purdue, getting their degree, and doing well and adding back to the community. So that's a neat story as well. And our, our alumni are scattered everywhere, so many of us, including myself, watched the SpaceX Demo 2 launch to the International Space Station and the return, and many of our alumni were honored by NASA for their contributions to that. Again, I put a link down here. If you follow us on social media, you can find most of these stories, but it's, it's neat. We've got alumni doing big things, alumni staying in town and doing interesting things, and we're adding to our research capabilities. I know we're getting close on time here, so let me give you a couple highlights of things. Some of the questions asked, what are you looking forward to doing in the next year or looking ahead? So for the next academic year that's going to start in the fall, we need to do something to continue to address these impacts of our, our large enrollment. So we've been doing work to add a, a teaching fellows program where you give graduate students a chance to be mentored by a faculty member, and then put that student, you know, she or he, in front of the classroom to actually teach, which we think will prepare our students for faculty jobs if they're interested in that. 
we're always looking to add additional teaching assistant positions above and beyond what the university pays for because we think that helps our student experience. We're also in the process of trying to add several new faculty members in the tenure track. And so I'm working on that at the moment. I can't share details because we're in negotiations, but I'm hoping to announce shortly we'll have several new additions to the faculty. Uh, as we get back on it, closer to real in-person meetings, we want to keep supporting our student activities. A lot of them came back as we figured out how to work with COVID and with, with our face masks and face shields and PPE. And some of our student rocket launch teams have been quite active as an example. But we're going to make sure we need to keep that going as we get back to a more new normal setup. One of the things that's also interesting is I think there's some things we've learned in being forced to go to online remote that actually have some best practices for just learning in general. And so some of those we're going to try to capture and maintain as we move forward. And personally, I've, I've, I've really started to look at the diversity and inclusion in, in the school, and I've been having several conversations with our students about their experiences, and that's something we have lots of room to improve on, and so I want to continue to work on that in the next academic year. Looking forward, we've got some big efforts in hypersonics, our aerospace autonomy, our U.S. research and test facility, CIS Lunar Initiative, all have exciting things going on. I showed you the hypersonics building. I can talk more about the other facilities. Zucro Labs, which is just an outstanding facility and, and probably the world's best university propulsion laboratory facility, has needs for growth and upgrades, and we're going to help with our partners in mechanical engineering to do that. I'd like to see some meaningful change in the diversity of our faculty, staff, and students. That's a much longer effort than just fixing that overnight, but I, I do want to work on that. We've got some ideas in, in play right now. I think that our faculty really have have done a lot that can be recognized and we don't always have the resources to do that. So I'm working on figuring out how to do that. And as we grow the faculty, if we want to get somebody to leave another university to come to Purdue, that recruitment requires some resources that we also need to work on. And, and, and so that's in the plans for me. I, I think we talk to other colleagues and often they're well established at another university. And so we need to make it attractive for them to come to Purdue if we want to do that. And our curriculum I had this on as a short-term goal recently, but as our enrollment goes up, it gets harder for us to experiment. We don't want to mess with something that's working, but we do know our curriculum needs to be updated. And so I've moved this a little bit to more medium and longer term to look at how do we evolve our curriculum to include more content that we think is relevant for today's aerospace engineers without losing the fundamentals. And that's not an easy thing to do. And right now with the large class sizes, I think we need to push this off, be aware of it, make some changes, but push off a big overhaul a little bit out further in the future. This is my last slide and I went a little bit over my intended time, but often people ask us, how can you engage with us? So Stacy, who I mentioned, Stacy Clarity does a great job with our social media. Uh, we've got a new group on LinkedIn. You may have already been able to join it, but there's a specific one for aeronautics and astronautics, Purdue Aeronautics and Astronautics on LinkedIn. That's one that's got a lot of effort. We've got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, other stuff that I don't even know about, I'm sure we're on. <laughs> the Purdue Day of Giving is coming up, and I know it always feels like we're always asking for money, but it is, it is expensive to run the school and keep us top notch, and so the Purdue Day of Giving is a chance to give directly to the school. Some of our facilities upgrades, the student support, faculty recognition, those may be bigger gifts, but if, if that's something you think is, is in your capability to do, we'd be happy to chat with you about how you could help us do that. And then I know one of the things that a lot, I've got a lot of alums, I looked at the attendee list and a lot of you are at the places that like to hire our students. And if you have internship opportunities or other opportunities, make sure you let us know. Um, sometimes we, we can't always just go find those and sometimes we don't know what's going on. And so if you can share those with us, that would be huge, a huge help for us. We've got a nice setup to share information with our undergraduate students. So with that, I think I probably went a little bit too long, but that was my quick overview. So let me stop sharing here real quick. And what I'd like to do next before we take Q&A is I'd like to introduce some of our students. And so I'm, first I'm gonna to introduce to you uh, Julia Kozlowski. So Julia is a senior here in aeronautics and astronautics. She's graduating in May and she's gonna stay with us to study her master's degree focused in propulsion. So she'll probably be out at Zucro Labs that I mentioned. Uh, Julia's got a, a neat story background. She transferred to Purdue in her sophomore year. And she's since she's been here with us, she's done a lot of work in rocketry, propulsion research. She's done a couple of internships, has been involved in outreach for K through 12. She's currently the president of the Purdue Women in Aerospace, which is our, one of our big student organizations. And, and Julia's done a great job hosting our virtual Amelia Earhart Summit. So we've done that in person for two years. This is our third, third go at that, the Women in Aerospace along with graduate women's gathering. 
runs this event to showcase the diverse experiences and the diverse number of people that are in aerospace. And that's been a great event going on this month. So Julie, let me turn it over to you. And I'll let you give a few words. All right, thank you so much, Professor Costley. Um, can you all hear and see me okay? I can hear you and see you fine, Julia. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so like Professor Costley said, my name is Julia Kozlowski. I'm a senior in aeronautical and astronautical engineering here at Purdue uh, with a specialization in propulsion. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, and I transferred to Purdue my sophomore year. I learned my freshman year that I really loved propulsion and working on different propulsion systems. And so I learned about Purdue's different opportunities in propulsion, both in and outside the classroom. So I decided to transfer. And my first year at Purdue as a sophomore uh, definitely involved some catching up on the first year engineering classes because I couldn't unfortunately get out of all of them. <laughs> but I started taking my first aeronautical and astronautical engineering classes that year. And I was soon able to settle and feel a lot more comfortable at Purdue. Um, and since coming here, I've been a part of a lot of different organizations and clubs. I was on the Purdue Space Program Liquid Rocket Team. I was an undergraduate research assistant at Zucro under Dr. Slava. And I've also had various leadership positions in different clubs. Um, so a lot of these leadership positions involved outreach, which was one of my passions. I was a Purdue Space Day volunteer and also outreach officer for um, an organization called Purdue Mars here at Purdue. Um, and both of these positions involved exposing young kids to aerospace engineering and STEM early on. And that's something that's important to me because one of my former bosses told me that, you know, by exposing young kids to STEM and engineering early on, they're going to be the next generation of scientists and engineers. So it's really important to do that. Um, this year, like Professor Costley said, I'm proud to be president of the Purdue Women in Aerospace Organization. Um, women in Aerospace focuses on combating the gender disparity in the aerospace field. And we do this by providing all aerospace students at Purdue with opportunities and events in education, networking, and um, professionalism. And it's been tough uh, this year because of COVID-19, as most things have moved virtually. Um, and actually, right now is the busiest time for women in aerospace and for me personally um, due to the Amelia Earhart Summit. So I am one of the heads of the Amelia Earhart Summit Planning Committee. Usually the Amelia Earhart Summit is an in-person weekend long event um, with panels, keynote speakers, workshops, and different interactive events. So this year it's completely virtual and it is um, going on right now. And so far we've had um, a lot of speakers from a lot of different places like SpaceX, NASA, Virgin Orbit, Virgin Galactic, Microsoft, Professor Crossley was one of our speakers. Um, we've also had some from CU Boulder and MIT, essentially all these different places you can name. Um, and so a lot of these events included like panels where we talked about what you can do with an aerospace engineering degree, the different diverse paths you can take in the aerospace community. And we also had a panel on the underrepresented groups in aerospace and sort of talking about their experiences. Um, and so, like I said, the summit is going on right now. It's a pretty busy time and it's been tough to plan, especially virtually, but overall, it's been a really fulfilling and successful experience for me and women in aerospace. Um, so I want to take some time to talk about my experiences at Purdue um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I remember a year ago, I was talking with one of my friends in AAE about um, the pandemic and what's been going on. And he said that he thought we were going to get sent home. And I was telling him, you know, kind of brushing it off because at this point it wasn't so bad. There weren't many cases. And, you know, of course, later that day, we got the email from Purdue saying that we were going to get sent home um, and not come back after spring break. And my first thought was, oh, no, I lost that bet, with my friend. And then my second thought was, this is going to be interesting. This is going to be completely different, something none of us had ever really dealt with before. Um, so when I was first at Purdue, I was thinking about how, you know, I made a lot of friends who were into the same things that I was. I was challenged and I learned a lot in my classes and I was in a lot of extracurriculars and suddenly everything was different. I went back and flew back to Los Angeles and finished my semester online. Um, my Zucro research was cut short and uh, all of my friends were back at their respective hometowns. But even though this was a very challenging and, and kind of sad time, I want to talk about how Purdue handled it. And, and I thought that, you know, 
a lot of my professors, a lot of the faculty honestly did a really good job with the transition to virtual and now with hybrid classes. I could tell that our professors really cared about us and that they really cared about how we were doing um, emotionally and mentally, not just, you know, making sure we were getting the material to to learn, um, but also that, you know, we were doing okay with everything that was going on. So this year, I haven't had a lot of in-person classes. I actually preferred to have the virtual classes just due to the pandemic, um, but I did have friends who had a lot of in-person classes and I was also in one in-person lab and every single time I went or one of them went, we never felt unsafe on campus. Um, Purdue did a really good job of de-densifying, making sure we were social distanced, making sure we were wearing masks and, you know, keeping those COVID cases numbers low, which was honestly impressive. Uh, but most importantly, Purdue has put this really big emphasis on mental and emotional health during this time, which I, as a student, really, really appreciated. Um, so I want to get into some of the career goals I have and how Purdue has helped me to grow um, in my career and in my education. So I really want to work on rocket propulsion. I want to work on the analysis or tests of rocket engines. Um, some of the past internships I have, um, I was at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory for two summers as a mission design systems engineering intern. Um, and I actually completed uh, final projects on trade studies of uh, different spacecraft propulsion systems. Last summer, I was um, at Northrop Grumman in the space propulsion group. Um, and actually, actually, I'm still part-time intern for them right now. And I plan to go back there next summer. And after graduating with my BS in May, in the fall, I'm going to be going to SpaceX as an associate engineer for the semester before returning to Purdue in the spring for my master's. So I want to say that Purdue has had a big part, if not the biggest part, in getting me where I am today and where I'm going. Um, I think transferring here was the best decision I could have ever made for myself and my career. Um, I've definitely taken advantage of unique opportunities at Purdue. I gained skills in testing and dealing with hardware and rotating detonation engines at Zucro um, under Professor Slava. I went to the Industrial Roundtable Career Fair and met um, Northrop Grumman recruiters and got connected with my current bosses who are actually Purdue alumni. And so, you know, they knew that because I went to Purdue, I had a solid education, I had relevant skills that were gonna be useful to me in industry and I could really be a good asset to their team. Um, and I also took place um, or took part in a virtual career fair this year and that's how I connected to a SpaceX recruiter and how I got my job for the fall. Um, so lastly, I just want to end with this. Uh, since I've gotten to Purdue, and especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Purdue and the School of AE has continued to show me that I made a really good decision in transferring here. And because I go here, I have a super bright future ahead of me. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Great, thanks, Julia. Thank you. Let me introduce next uh, the other the other student we wanted to have you hear from today. So this, next is Zach Marshall. Zach's also a senior here at Aeronautics and Astronautics, graduating in May. He's specializing in, specializing in our design and our dynamics control areas of emphasis. And if I understand correctly, Zach's going to be heading to the Boeing company after he graduates in May. Uh, during the 2020 calendar year, he was the president of the Purdue student branch of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And most of us know that as AIAA. It's our professional society for aerospace engineers. And if I can brag a bit on Zach's behalf, I know you didn't put this in the bullet items, Zach, but he's also one of our astronaut scholars and one of this year's Purdue Engineering Fellows recipients. So it's that, Zach, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Zach Marshall. I'm originally from Orland Park, Illinois, about 20 miles southwest of Chicago. I'm a senior undergraduate student, and I'll be graduating in May with dual degrees in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics and Aerospace Financial Analysis from the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology. Within aerospace engineering, my major area of specialization is aerospace systems design, and my minor area of specialization is dynamics and control, focusing on the aeronautics domain. Throughout my nearly four years at Purdue, three of which I spent at the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, my fellow students and I have been afforded uh, with world-class academic and professional development opportunities. Um, it goes without saying that this past year greatly disrupted our lives as students, changing the way that we live and eat in university residence and dining halls, uh, the way that we receive instruction, the way that we are assessed, 
even the way that we communicate with professors and our classmates. At about this time last year, I found our sudden shift to online classes added a layer of difficulty to already difficult coursework. Uh, the very beginning had its fair share of technical difficulties, logistical issues, and simple inefficiencies in relaying physical concepts through virtual means. Um, going from fully in-person lectures to asynchronous online lectures, as well as moving off campus back home within the span of a couple of weeks was a quite dramatic change and definitely necessitated alterations to my study habits. Uh, but I believe professors and students alike worked to make the best out of the hand that we were dealt. Um, in the fall 2020 semester, I took seven courses with three of those being fully online and the remaining four being in person with an online option. Uh, I can echo what uh, Julia said about never having any, any concern about my safety um, in, in any, any part of my uh, experience on campus at, at Purdue. Uh, and then with the exception of all my courses this semester, uh, with you, with the exception of my senior, senior seminar course this semester, all of my courses have been in person with live stream lectures. Um, and I appreciate that flexibility that the pandemic situation has actually afforded us, namely the avail availability of lecture recordings that I may routinely reference to clear my understanding of a specific topic. Um, I believe our learning has adapted uh, very smoothly uh, to our new reality. And I believe our increasingly effective use of web conferencing platforms has made the virtual transition a point of strength rather than one of weakness for our, our school. Um, the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics empowers our education by supporting experiential learning in aerospace student organizations and leading edge undergraduate aerospace research, in addition to our traditional learning in, uh, in a classroom setting. I have personally been active in both undergraduate research and student organizations. For the past few years, I've worked in the Advanced Aviation Analytics Institute for Research Center of Research Excellence at the Purdue Airport. Uh, under the guidance of Dr. John Mott, uh, working on US, UAS airspace separation mm -hmm. conflict projects and FAA uh, Airport Cooperative Research Program University Design Competition teams. Um, I started this undergraduate research journey through the Discovery Park Undergraduate Research Internship Program. And I can say uh, that the nature of the projects I was assigned to and the great guidance of my research mentor have allowed me to explore and discover my passions within aerospace. Um, and they have absolutely been integral to my academic success uh, in this program since. Another highlight of my time at Purdue uh, has been serving two terms on the executive board of the Purdue student branch of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, first as treasurer and then as president for the 2020 calendar year, joining and eventually leading Purdue AIAA, which is one of the largest aerospace student groups on campus and in the country by membership, uh, was a truly transformative experience in terms of uh, allowing for hands-on application of concepts that we learn every day in lecture hall. And despite our sudden transition to a virtual setting last year, I'm proud that Purdue AIAA exhibited a record growth of 45% year over year in membership revenue during the fall 2020 semester uh, and has continued to support various design teams. These design teams include a, a vertical flight systems team operating in the electric vertical takeoff and landing EV toll space and a hybrid rocket team established in 2018 uh, in partnership with another student organization, Purdue Space Program, that to my knowledge, has since made Purdue the only school in the country with concurrent student-led liquid hybrid and solid fuel rocket teams. Also during my time at Purdue AAA, I had the pleasure of participating in youth outreach events such as Purdue Space Day and Purdue Aviation Day to inspire future generations of aerospace engineers. Um, and then with local and national support from AAA, the Purdue chapter also had the great honor of hosting guest speakers, uh, ranging from NASA astronauts to Air Force generals, um, who all were part of their wisdom on a membership basis. Um, and then we also host dozens of diverse aerospace companies uh, who all recruit from our ranks. Outside of Purdue AIAA, I'm also an active member of the Purdue Sigma Gamma Tau uh, National Aerospace Engineering Honor Society chapter, as well as our Purdue Mortar Board, Purdue uh, Phi Beta Kappa, and Astronaut Scholarship Foundation Honor Society. Um, the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics gives us uh, a deep yet holistic understanding of aerospace concepts, and I believe that really positions us well to contribute in industry internships. I've completed internship and mentorship programs in a variety of roles uh, at Republic Airways and American Airlines, and I'm uh, currently a part-time virtual student federal service e-intern within NASA's Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate. These experiences in industry have uh, greatly complemented and directly enhanced the knowledge that I glean from coursework, um, and such internships and co-ops are, are heavily encouraged and enabled by AAE staff and faculty. Upon graduation in May, I am extremely thrilled to be joining the Boeing company, uh, specifically within Boeing Defense Space and Security as a systems engineer based in St. Louis, Missouri. 
Um, especially in these challenging times, I'm very grateful for the great online and in person instruction from our wonderful uh, AAE professors, as well as for the, the many fantastic opportunities that the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics continues to offer us uh, as we reach this uh, modern golden era of human spaceflight and rapidly approach impactful new frontiers in hypersonics and advanced air mobility, among others. It's an, an incredibly exciting time to be studying aerospace. And I can't imagine a, a greater place to do so than right here at, at Purdue School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Thank you. Great, thanks. Zach. So Julie, maybe you can turn your camera back on. I think the idea is we'll kind of try to address questions like a kind of, we will address questions kind of like we're a panel. And to help facilitate that, uh, Stacy Clarity is gonna help us read some of those. I see them popping up in the Q and A. So Stacy, if you wanna, Maybe we should manage the Q and A first, since it's our live participants. We can try to answer those, and then we can answer some of the questions that were provided beforehand, if we have time. Sure, that sounds good. Okay. I'm just kind of scrolling through. Okay, so um, one of our alums, um, Mark Sleppy, asked, "How are you planning to update the curriculum?" to allow AE students to start out strong in their careers in this new paradigm of the pie shape engineer. And he describes the pie shape engineer, Bill, if you need that. I'm assuming this question is directed to you for curriculum. Yeah, it um, probably is. And, and I know Mark, so I think I know what he's talking about. So, you know, we used to talk, the industry and, and academe often talked that the industry really liked T-shape engineers. So, especially aerospace engineers. So you have a pretty good awareness of everything that goes on in an aerospace vehicle, which is why we make our students who say, oh, I'm a structures person, but we make them take aerodynamics and we make them take propulsion and we make them take dynamics control. So they've got that. And then we've had them concentrate in something. So that's like the leg of the T. So I, I think, maybe I can find it myself here, but I think Mark's referring to big data as the other leg and it makes it like a capital pie. So uh, how do we, how do we handle like, you know, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all these things come up frequently. So right now at Purdue, we've got some quote requirements for having data science in our curriculum. And so it shows up in a small amount in a few of our classes. And the challenge to Mark and everybody else listening is how do we add that without removing something that we think is important? So we're wrestling with that a little bit. What I would like to be able to do, now the details is always where the, where the tricky part is, but I think there's many topics like this where we should have smaller chunks of classes. So if we can figure out how to do one credit modules, that might make it easier. Do all students need like say nine credits of dynamics control? Maybe they only need seven or maybe they only need five. But right now we're so built on the three credit model, it's hard to take out something without feeling like you're getting rid of all three credits. So I'm not sure if I've answered Mark's question directly, but I think we've been trying to inject it in some of our existing courses, particularly in what we call AA301, the singles and systems class, has some data analytics content. And we could probably have a couple of modules that people could add on so they could do that. And as we have these modules, we might, might be able to take some of our traditional courses and a student could get one or two credits out of that. The tricky part is making sure we can pull that off and also not getting rid of the fundamentals, but that's our current thinking point. And as I mentioned during my presentation, one of the challenges is the best way to do that is to pilot it with a couple students in an experimental class. But at the moment, we don't quite have the bandwidth to have a faculty member go off and do an experimental class with a small number of students. That's a bit of the challenge. So hopefully I caught that, Mark. And, and thanks for joining us tonight, Mark, by the way. Good to hear from you. Quite a few quite a few of the questions we got in advance. Um, and we have some parents joining us tonight as well as alumni uh, were about internship opportunities and, and co-op opportunities. And then beyond that, job opportunities once our students graduate. So let's just start with the internships here. And, and Zach and Julia, you spoke to some amazing opportunities you've had um, in terms of internships and co-ops and those kind of things since you've been here. How, can you just maybe tell the folks, how, how did you go about that? What was that process like for you and uh, maybe just offer some, some tips for some of the parents listening tonight on, on what they can maybe talk to their, their um, sons and daughters about. Yeah, I can speak to some of that. Um, I have definitely been in a position where, you know, I'm applying to 
20, 30 applications for internships one summer and, you know, not hearing anything back for a few months and, you know, getting disheartened and just having a ton of applications out there. Um, and some advice that I probably have is number one, um, I, I'm one to like compare myself to other people and, you know, I've kind of learned to, to get over that a little bit, but it can be hard, you know, when you see all of your friends getting internships and then you don't and you feel like you need one, you know, um, even like a freshman or sophomore when I had friends getting internships and you absolutely don't need an internship your summer of freshman year or sophomore year, um, but you feel like you need to when you have all these people around you getting them. Um, honestly, the best advice I can give is just to keep trying keep applying you're going to be sending 30 40 maybe even 50 applications one summer just to you know get noticed because it's it's very competitive um and that's something that i really had to sort of experience firsthand you know and i was like well i'm good you know i have good grades and i do all this stuff and you, you'd think you know that would be enough but you know ae is very very competitive and that's just something that i had to you know kind of learn the hard way um, another piece of advice is even the smallest little connections you may think that, you know, your kids don't have or, or current students don't have, use them anyway, <laughs> because I, I was lucky enough to get an internship really early on in my college career at NASA JPL, and I totally did that by the smallest connection I thought I didn't have, and I just thought it was a long shot, but I went for it anyway, and it ended up, you know, changing everything. So even the smallest connections you think you don't have, you really do, and, and they can make a really big difference. Um, I hope that provides some perspective, at least for me personally, but Zach, go ahead if you have anything else to add. Well, yes, I would totally agree with the volume part of that. Uh, so casting a, a very wide net uh, for internship applications, especially is important uh, from my experiences. I would also say that when you submit um, either a portfolio or a cover letter and a resume to that prospective employer, tailor it specifically, not just to the, um, the company, but also to the uh, posting, the, the job requisite. Um, there, a lot has been said about uh, perhaps automated screening technologies that go through uh, resumes themselves, but ultimately, I, I do believe that many of them land in uh, the hands of a, a human, uh, either a recruiter or a uh, hiring manager themselves, and uh, including as, as many um, technical uh, aspects of, of, of your history and, and relaying that in a brief um, yet impactful manner is very important. Um, I would say another cornerstone of, of applying to internships um, and just getting into contact with recruiters is attending career fairs. Purdue is, is fantastic about those career fairs. Uh, our our uh, larger, uh, our industrial roundtable is one of the largest student run career fairs in the country. And then we have a few others throughout the spring semester as well. Um, and also student organizations, um, many of those have nights where we, we host a, a company to come in and talk to our members. Uh, and then uh, again, as Julia said, uh, connections in, in any form that you can uh, muster, um, you, you'd be surprised how far they, they can take you. We actually you, had a question. I'm sorry, Bill. I don't know if you wanted me to add or, or if, if you were directing that toward the students too. I mean, some of the, I mentioned really quickly is we do have contacts in industry who, who are willing to help provide advice and inputs about how to write your resume to get those jobs. Um, we have a pretty strong mentoring program with our industrial advisory council and some of our outstanding aerospace engineers can also help with that. One of the challenges with a large student enrollment is that uh, a faculty member like me can't just it, the physical time doesn't exist for me to sit down and spend half hour, hour with every single student to provide that kind of help. So that's kind of a challenge, but we have ways to help students do, to, to get that input through other mechanisms. Zach mentioned the, the career expos and career fairs, and we had just gotten a question in advance, so I just wanted to answer this really quickly, asking whether the aerospace Aerospace Career Expo would be rescheduled for later this semester, and I reached out to AE, um, SAC, and they said that it will not happen this semester, but they're hoping that they can get some more companies to sign up in the fall, and right now the date is early September for that. That could change, but that right now is kind of the general time frame. Okay, moving on. Just figured I would answer that because it connected to something that we talked about. Um, Sorry, I'm bouncing between the list I have in front of me and then in this uh, in here as well. Bill, I don't know if you can answer this. What do we know? What percentage of students receive internships uh, as we, undergraduate we, and graduate we students? Don't, 
We don't really because the students have to report that to us. So some students tell us that, but I don't think we have enough data to have a definitive answer for that, unfortunately. Um, but, but, you know, anecdotally, a lot of the students get internships, but I don't know what the percentage is because, because the reporting is so low. So that's, that's unfortunate. I can't answer that one directly. So there was another question uh, for Zach and Julia about COVID. Let me scroll here. Just how how is your um, remote? And you, you spoke to this a little bit, but how has learning by remote impacted your experience, especially the ability to interact with your peers and get hands-on experience in labs? Zach, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. So um, I'd like to think that the the core benefit of um, transitioning to virtual format to remote learning is that uh, we can connect with more people and we can gain a, a broader and more global perspective uh, on the, the work that we are doing and the concepts that we are studying. It allows for a bit more flexibility in the workload distribution and self-pacing. Uh, along with that self-pacing, however, comes self-discipline. Um, I think in a, in a virtual format as well, we have improved collaboration and communication. Uh, I know that sometimes late at night, if I were working on a, a group project uh, a year ago, uh, I would have to um, schedule time to meet up with my group members in person. And right now I can send them a, a very quick WebEx link and, and iron out our issues um, within minutes rather than walking to Armstrong or, or doing something like that. Uh, I'd also say that accessibility um, has been improved within comfort and convenience of the way that we receive uh, all of our education. And then also individualized attention uh, I think in the past, some students may have been intimidated to attend office hours uh, based on the, just the one-on-one the -on -one dynamic with the professor. But I've seen that uh, through, through the web, more students have, uh, at least anecdotally, have, have been attending office hours. Uh, and I think that's, that's really a great thing. Uh, there are some issues with, with virtual, trans, or virtual uh, learning as well. You could argue that there's a, a bit of a less personal connection. Um, I think hybrid classes kind of take care of that and make it a, a bit more efficient and stable. Uh, and then some subjects just cannot be as readily, readily conveyed in virtual format as they could be in a hands-on lab setting. Um, but there are uh, numerous tools to, to get around that. And then also, uh, as we mentioned before, Pre has taken a ton of, of safety precautions and, and making sure that all of our students who are attending uh, in-person lab sections uh, have all the social distancing and uh, face mask and um, protective uh, uh, control measures to ensure that there is no viral transmission and hopefully that will return uh, in the near future. Um, I can give some other thoughts on this. Uh, kind of going back to what Zach said, I feel like it has been easier for me to for example, like send emails to professors and um, like PAs. I've not saying in the past I was scared of it or anything, but I feel like it's it's become more normal to like send emails. So I'm not really afraid to just like, you know, I need help on something. I'm just going to email them right away. And and because people are usually on the computer a lot nowadays, I usually get an answer pretty fast. So there's a, a benefit in that. And you don't end up with that fear of going to office hours and like being the only one there sort of thing. Um, something I can see can be difficult, especially for younger students who maybe haven't been to school very long is finding people to like do homework with um, or, um, you know, getting to know their classmates because maybe they're not going in person. They're not meeting people. They can't meet with them, you know, at walk or somewhere and do homework because uh, that's how I got through a lot of my classes by doing homework together. So a benefit for me has been, you know, I still have Zoom calls with like my friends to do homework together. Um, but something that I know organizations like Women in Aerospace are trying to do is have these virtual social nights so that even though they're virtual, you know, freshmen, sophomores, people who are new to the major, the school can still come and to get to know each other and find people in their classes and do their homework together, you know, via Zoom. Because um, I can see how not having those in person interactions all the time in classes can really, you know, then you're stuck kind of doing your homework by yourself. Um, and in some classes, I really just can't imagine doing it by, completely by yourself. Um, but yeah, it's it, it both has its benefits and and its disadvantages, like Zach pointed out. Um, but I think most people now are probably pretty used to it. But like Professor Costley said, kind of hoping that next fall I won't be here, but 
by the spring and then next year for everyone else, um, it'll kind of go back to normal. Bill, let's shift this one to you. I, we've gotten quite a few questions, again, previously, and I think coming in through the chat and the Q&A, just about kind of the employ, employment environment for students who are graduating from us. Can, can you just maybe shed some insight into that? What does that look like? And Sure. Yeah, from what I've heard. Yeah, and we have, again, I, I rely on our Industrial Advisory Council to, to help with this. Um, we did a panel, actually, with several of the Industrial Advisory Council members not too long ago um, where, they, where they talked about the, the job environment. So I think locally there's some interesting challenges from COVID, right? You know, business has been knocked off, off center, trying to figure out how to do things, including hiring and things remotely. So I think there was a little bit of a lull. But the aerospace industry broadly has a, as an age issue and has for a while, um, the average age of the most aerospace companies and organizations is, is close to 50, if not higher than 50 in some places. So there's a great need for aerospace engineers going forward. We've talked a lot of the sort of new, what we call new entrants. So on the space side, that's the Virgins, the you know, Blue Origin, SpaceX. In fact, it feels like SpaceX is just like a, a, a Purdue Alumni Association out in, <laughs> in Southern California. Julia's laughing because she spent some time there. Um, so we've got good ties with those companies and sending people there. The traditionals, I know Boeing Commercial has got some struggles right now because the commercial industry's had its issues and Boeing's had its own issues, but I think that will come back travel. When Richard Abalafia talked to us as one of our 75th anniversary talks, he's a pretty well-respected aviation analyst, says that basically it's just on a, on a medicated coma right now. And once we get the ability to travel and vaccines are out and people start traveling, once one business person starts traveling, their competitors are going to start traveling. He needs to come back. That's a long answer to say. I think it looks pretty rosy right now. Um, again, the number of students getting jobs is all self-reported. And so we only know if the students report to us if they got a job. So I can't give you good numbers on the exact percentage of how many people are actually getting jobs. But I haven't, as head, I have, haven't heard any more complaints during COVID than I did pre-COVID about not getting jobs. You know, there's always some students who struggle to get jobs for all kinds of reasons. They, they're very picky about the job that they want and it's not available or, or something like that. But I haven't heard any more complaints. So I think that the job outlook looks pretty rosy. And true also on the aerospace side, we have a couple of alums at companies looking at urban air mobility, which has got a lot of challenges, but a lot of promise. And so there's a lot of money in that right now. And we send a lot of our, our, our students off to companies like that too. So I think overall it's pretty promising. It's great to hear for everyone on the call, I think. Uh, let's let's shift back to, to Julie and Zach. There's a specific question for both of you from Kevin Metrokavich, one of our alums who works at NASA. And he says he speaks with prospective AE students regularly and provides advice from his alumni and industry perspective. But what kind of advice would you, as current students, provide to prospective students to best prepare them for their academic career in AAE or in engine, engineering in general? Julia, go. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I was like, I can start on this one. Um, so probably like the biggest pieces of advice um, that I have for any prospective students are um, at least some things that I've experienced. I kind of mentioned this before. I tend to compare myself a lot to other people, um, people maybe who, you know, will grasp concepts sooner than I do, maybe get jobs that I want and things like that. Um, really, you're, you know, you're on your own timeline, you're on your own chapter of your own book. So, you know, really just, just take your time with it and don't rush yourself because, you know, you're not everybody else. So it's, it's not, you know, you're not meant to compare yourself to other people because you're just, you're not the same people. Um, and something else is that AE is really tough and, you know, the people who make it in AE are not the people who succeed every single time. They're not the people who get an A on every test. They're not the people who, you know, get every single job they ever apply for. They're not the people who never get rejected. They're the people who, you know, fail, get rejected and keep going. Because frankly, I've ran into a lot of my own, you know, people I know, people that I, I'm friends with that, you know, and even mm -hmm. I've, I've done this before too. I will fail or I'll, you know, get rejected from something or, you know, something will happen to me and it'll make me feel like I want to quit. I'll be like, oh, I just want to quit. I'm just not good enough, you know, and it's really, you know, 
it's really not that I should be succeeding at everything. Um, I know I'm going back to SpaceX, but Elon Musk said that, you know, you learn more from failures than you do from, some, from successes. And um, he's crazy, but he's right about that. And, um, you know, it, it really is more about you failing and just learning from it and, and keep moving on. It's not really just about succeeding at everything because then you'll, you'll never learn. Um, so that's probably the best piece of advice I have. Yes, to tag on to that, uh, I would say that you, you need to remember that failure is an event, right? Not a person. Um, we all have our, our difficulties along the way, but it's, it's the, how we, we bounce back from those and, and compose ourselves uh, when things aren't going right that, that will define uh, how we perform in the future. Uh, as, as terms of, in terms of traditional academic success, I would say that uh, just doing what the professor usually tells you to do in the syllabus and in the, the first few uh, uh, course sessions is, is paramount. So that includes for me just reading a textbook or sections of the textbook that I deem pertinent to whatever I'm studying, uh, attending office hours, not being intimidated by uh, the any dynamics there, um, starting homework projects, exams, studying uh, well before due dates, and, and just supplementing my education with extracurricular experiences. I know Purdue has a very rich uh, offering uh, over a thousand student organizations, uh, both academic and, and social, um, and supplementing whatever you're learning in class with uh, hands on. The application of those concepts is really just important for uh, uh, academic development in, in, uh, in a holistic sense. And then time management and dedication has been uh, increasingly important during our, our virtual work from home um, period here. So establishing personal standards for work submission and, uh, and holding yourself to it is very important, uh, something that I try to do in, in everything that I do. Uh, sometimes that does necessitate putting in, putting in long hours um, but also remember to be as efficient and effective with your time. Um, work smart uh, in addition to, to working hard. And then having self-control to set internal deadlines for assignments and deliver on those. Uh, but also recognizing that uh, your work style needs to be tailored to your personality and situation. Um, and then we all need well-placed breaks and, and other activities to increase uh, the, the marginal utility we get out of our time. Um, so there is no one uh, size uh, suits all uh, solution for uh, for for academic success, um, but I'd say that uh, just heeding the advice of, of professors at the beginning of courses um, and, and not being deterred easily uh, will take you quite far. And don't be afraid to ask us for help. We're not all that scary. We might seem scary, but I don't think we're really all that scary. <laughs> I hope I'm not that scary. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's get to a couple research kind of base questions, Bill, before, before we have to wrap up here. They were, they were provided in advance. Okay, just some updates. So uh, someone asked what is happening, essentially what's, what's happening with the, the Saab plant um, with the new Boeing Air Force trainer airplane. Do you have an update on that? Hey, well, so they're, they're, they're working on busy, building the physical plant. It's going to build parts of the fuselage. And I, as I understand, they'll go on like trucks or trains out to St. Louis for, for final assemblies of the plan at the moment. Um, and it's going to bring, hopefully it'll bring some engineering jobs here, but it's going to bring a lot of manufacturing, I mean, high skill manufacturing jobs, but a lot of manufacturing jobs initially. And Saab's also been talking with Purdue about other research activities. Right now, they're kind of emphasizing in the radar and secure communications thing. So aeronautics and astronautics doesn't have quite as big a role as, as electrical and computer, but we're hoping for other interactions with Saab going forward. So maybe a long answer. They're they're putting the plan up right now, and, and we'll start building shortly. Any in space robotics research work at Purdue now that you know of? So it, it depends a little bit on, on um, how you classify in space robotics, but we do have faculty that are working on all kinds of different things. You know, for autonomy for spacecraft in flight. Uh, one of our relatively new faculty members, Rain Day, she's been doing work. Uh, it includes uh, solar powered rovers for use on the moon part of a NASA study. Um, I don't know that we have anybody working, say, like on the arm for the space station. I don't know we have that level of detail, but there are space robotics things writ, writ large going on at Purdue, rendezvous, and that sort of work is going on here at Purdue. One more that we got in advance is directly, uh, directly um, for you, Bill. I'm pulling up my sheet here. Uh, do you have, what are your thoughts on the pace of innovation in aerospace technology, is it fast enough? What's the next giant leap, so to speak? And what can we do to boost it? Oh man, 
Uh, so it depends on where you're sitting and how you might view that, but I think it's incredibly fast. I think things are going really quick and, and sometimes it's hard to keep up with it. Um, uh, you know, well, like I, I, I do some work related to urban air mobility and that's got a lot of challenges. And one of the issues there is how are we going to certify those vehicles? And I know the FAA is working hard with a lot of the companies to figure out how to do that. Uh, but that's, a, that's an example where I think the technology has outpaced um, some of our ability to, to, to get things going forward. I think autonomy writ large is going to have a big, big impact on the aerospace industry. Um, you know, if we make airplanes easier to fly, maybe general aviation becomes a more traditional approach to, to transportation over in a regional sense. Urban air mobility has got some big potential. Again, I don't want to make it overly real. I'm, I'm optimistic because I'm an aerospace engineer and I like aircraft and I think it's a neat idea, but it's got some challenges, but autonomy will make that possible. Uh, autonomy might also make larger aircraft possible. It'll be important for defense. So that's, that's a big one we're working on. Uh, hypersonics is really big here at Purdue. Uh, that's important for national defense. It's also important for access to space and re-entry to the, to the earth, but also entry into planetary atmospheres. That's, that's one where there's a lot of things we still need to learn. Um, we got to do something about sustainable aviation. So I'm interested in how we, it's really hard to beat the energy density of, of petroleum based fuel, but how do we do, how do we replace that and still get all the benefits from aerospace we provide? Um, I think they're too numerous. I don't know if I could pick one. That's the, like the biggest thing. Um, there's a lot. And I think that's also what's driving our enrollment up, right? You know, this SpaceX and Blue Origin have a lot of excitement. But the opportunities at, at uh, you know, in autonomy and in making aviation sustainable and in providing broadband internet from satellites, you know, these are all things that are, that are driving our enrollment because there's lots of opportunity. I guess I'm over answering your question, Stacy, or, or the person's question, but I can't pick one that's like the, 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 the big thing. I think it's going really fast. I, I think the key is to make sure we're doing it safely. And that's maybe the bigger challenge. So we are past eight o'clock now. So there were a couple questions that were submitted in advance that we didn't get to. I will go ahead and email answers to those questions to those folks so we can wrap up here tonight. Bill, do you want to go ahead and close this out? Sure. Well, and thanks. I know there's a lot of questions we didn't get to. So that, that's great. It shows the excitement that, that, our, that our parents and students and friends and alums all have for us. So I, I really appreciate your participation. Like Stacy says, we'll try to save these and we'll try to Try to get these back uh, some some kind of response to you as best we can. So again, uh, thanks to everyone for your support for, for Aeronautics and Astronautics in all kinds of ways. You know, your cheerleader support, your willingness to send your your sons and daughters here for education. If you're one of our alums, for your support and in, in continuing to help us, whether it's financially, whether it's um, providing mentorship to one of our students, um, helping us when when a Purdue alum gets out to your your company and and bring him into the the Purdue family at that company. I've always been amazed at how how tightly knit the Boilermaker network is at an aerospace. Um, I, occasionally, I, I regret that I didn't do my undergrad here, <laughs> just given the connections that I see. So with all of that, thank you so much for participating this evening. I know we didn't get to everybody's questions, so I apologize for that. We'll do the best we can. Hope you all stay safe. Um, when it's your turn to get your vaccine, please go consider doing that so that we can all stay safe. And hopefully we'll do one of these maybe before the fall semester. I can give you an update and then have a much rosy picture of things going forward. Thanks also to, to Julia and Zach. Thank you so much for providing the student context for our, for our participants tonight. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking your time out. If you have a homework now that's late, tell them Professor Crossley made you do this tonight. And they probably won't give you an extension, but, <laughs> but you can still tell them it's my fault. It's the stress-free week, so, yeah, so we're good. good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks oh, I actually had a, uh, sure. I had a question, Professor Crossley. Can we put in our email to the chat in case they're like, Parents, professors, if, students. If you're, to, if you're willing to do that, go ahead and do that before we close down. Okay. okay. Thank you. Certainly. And and if people know how to want to get a hold of me, they can. My email is my last name at purdue.edu.